Hey everybody, uh, I just wanted to take the time to make a quick follow-up video. Um, yesterday I did a voice lesson uh, and coaching with my teacher Robert Grayson here at LSU. And here I mean in Baton Rouge, this is actually my house. We're in my office now. But um, I got a lot of questions from you guys uh, that I didn't get a chance to address. And so I went ahead and just kind of jotted them all down with your names and I wanted to address some of them because some of them are uh, really, really interesting questions. And I wanted to just quickly go through them so that you guys could uh, get your questions answered. So thank you so much for watching everybody. That was really, really amazing. I had a really fun time. I'm sorry about the microphone issue. It was something we didn't know because we couldn't, we didn't know what's happening. It was very impromptu. This whole idea literally hap was like half an hour before the lesson. So thank you for everybody for tuning in and for your amazing questions. So sorry about the mic. Hopefully it'll be better now. Now we have a normal mic. Okay. Alyssa Holly says, I am a young soprano who's having issues with my breath. I collapse too quickly and I blow out too much air. Any exercises that might be helpful for me? Hi, Alyssa. So that's a really wonderful question. So when you collapse too quickly and you blow out too much air, that's the kind of thing you just have to build the stamina to learn to do. So when you're breathing and you're doing your exercises, you need to, as you're exhaling, focus on keeping the same as, as though you were inhaling more air. So your body needs to remain here. And as you exhale, so your natural tendency is to this way. So you need to fight that and try to literally pull back the other way. So don't go backward, but pull back as in, as you're exhaling. As long as possible, I'm keeping my ribs as open as I can, as long as that I can. And then never collapse, even when you let go. Always keep this position in line, your ribs are nice and lifted. This is spread here. Your shoulders are down and back. Sometimes it helps me to put my hands behind in my pockets because like my butt pockets actually keeps my shoulders down and back. So you're inhaling, again, you inhale from the, I always start from the bottom here and I think to inhale all the way up. I don't inhale from just here or just here. I inhale from the entire length of my torso because it's a fuller inhalation that way. So the inhale, the exercise would be blow everything out. First, inhaling from the bottom here, letting the ribs naturally spread. And as you're exhaling, you could try using like the consonant s, right? So, s, and I'm not letting this collapse. As long as you can, using a s consonant. Sometimes you can just or whatever, but if that feels like it's too tense on your lips, S is, a, S is a very common one. Another thing you can do is lay on your back, and I'm not gonna do that on camera, but lay on your back, put a book or some other heavy thing on your stomach and what, breathe normally and your stomach will come up and down, your diaphragm will lift up and down this way and you'll feel, and the book will come up and come down, right? Inhale, the book will come up on your back, right? You inhale, the book comes up, and exhale and try to keep the book at that same level. So don't let the book come back down. So you're inhaling. You're exhaling and you're almost pushing this way as you're exhaling. So don't suck in your gut as you exhale. You do that generally just throughout the day when you're sitting on the train, when you're sitting in your car, when you are walking down the street, try to think about keeping the integrity of your torso open as you are exhaling and keeping your shoulders down the back. It's very important not to do this, to keep the shoulders down the back when you inhale and when you exhale, let this be spread and open and free. And your head and your neck is not here, but that it's here. That's kind of the good alignment. That's that Alexander thing I was talking about a lot of the video. So that's the good alignment that you want to maintain all the time. This is long. This is free, your shoulders are down, and then your abs and your torso is doing the work when you're singing and when you're breathing and when you're not singing and all the time, okay? So that is a couple breathing exercises for you as far as trying not to collapse. I mean, it takes building, getting used to it. Some people try holding their breath as an exercise, so they inhale, hold for four or five counts, and then exhale. So like inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four and then do it on five or eight or 10 or however much and build up that way. And I think that's a lovely exercise, but I don't want you, I don't want to encourage you to hold because it's not about 
holding your breath. You don't need, you're not a swimmer, you know, you don't need to hold your breath. What you need to learn to do is control the exhalation. So I would encourage you instead to inhale for four or five counts, exhale for four or five counts, inhale for eight counts, exhale for eight counts, that type of thing. So that you practice controlled exhalation, keeping this engaged. Sorry, that's a long answer, but that's, that's, that's why I didn't want to type these. <laughs> okay, so that was a really great question from Alyssa. Martha Meacham asked, what role did Bob rescue in Traviata? He rescued Alfredo. Um, my friend Anye Rossi, he says, O.C. Ro o. Rossini is his online name. Can you troll in the long ah before the reprise of the second verse of, of um, the aria from Lucia, Cuando rapito in estasi? A lot of people do do that. It is absolutely a choice. It's totally legitimate. And I would absolutely present it to a conductor. And if they let me do it, I'll do it. Thanks for the advice. Uh, Callie Cooper, when are you doing Violetta again, girl? Whenever I get asked to do Violetta again, I would try. We are, it's its not on the books right this minute, but it's on the art operas that we are seeking or trying to propose for me. Because, you know, Violetta, Traviata gets done a lot. And every company has different tastes of what they like in Traviata. Some people like a much heavier Traviata than I am, and some people like a much lighter Traviata than I am. So it really depends on where and when and timing. So I'm trying and I want to very much. Thank you for encouraging me to sing it again, because I want to. Um, what are your impressions, this is from Paul Kentor. What are your impressions of working with a coach or singer of the opposite gender? And I, I did address this in the video, but it's a great question. Um, there is no gender law that says men teach better singers that are male and females teach better singers that are female. You can learn something from every voice teacher as long as they know about the mechanics of singing, which is breath, support, vowels, and modif modifying vowels to suit you and just singing in a healthy, well-produced way. I have learned, I have had teachers that were women, I've had teachers that were men, I've had teachers, my only issue for me personally is that I imitate. So. If you are an imitator, if you sing by mocking what you hear, then it may be actually better for you to study with someone of the opposite gender so that you're not going to be encouraged to m imitate that singer. Unless you want to sound exactly like them and then fine, good for you. But I feel like it's much more productive to just have a teacher that is just qualified. Gender doesn't matter. Um... <laughs> C'est une mise en abîme. I'm not sure what that meant, Victor Leonard. You asked if it was a mise en abîme, which is, abîme means abyss. So, I don't know. I'm sorry, Victor. I don't know. Je sais pas ce que tu dis avec uh, c'est une mise en abîme. Il faut que tu me demandes encore. All right. Natalia Trigo. Is there a technical tip for color to run high F for the first queen of the night? If you don't naturally live up there and you're trying to manufacture a high F for queen of the night, I have had to manufacture super high notes once and I used a whistle tone. I don't encourage you to sing higher than what is your natural range. If you do not live and have a comfortable high F, you can build, it, you can build a top, but you need to really make sure that you're doing it with breath and with a good vowel. So sometimes people say, I like up there to sing on ah, as in cat, ah. you know. Um, but it's all about, for me, I don't have a high F, Queen of the Night F, so I can't really tell you other than, I, for me, I have to, I have whistle. I cannot take my regular full high notes up to F. So uh, if you don't have full high notes up to F, you can try whistle technique, which is basically when that switch that happens after you get to like high, for me, it's like high E flat, high E natural. My piano's not on. For me, it's high E flat, high E natural, and I whistle. I guess I could demo. Yeah. Jesus, y'all. That's a regular E. Now, here I have to whistle because I don't have it. So I go. That's a whistle. I hate it and it doesn't feel comfortable. That's why I almost never sing up there. F, I would have to whistle. I don't warm up. I only barely warm up to there and I don't have a real one. So if you can whistle it, do it. But whatever you do, you need to sing with support. You need to sing with support and you need to sing in a, in a non-tense place. Like I get very tense up there because I don't. Those aren't natural notes for me. I hope that helps. Just sing on the breath. Okay, what advice do, from Leah? What advice do you have for young singers who are undergraduate students? Uh, I also addressed this in the video. Building good habits now. Good study habits, learning to learn your music efficiently. So going through the text, 
so when I learn a new role, I always go through the entire, I don't even look, I, I kind of quickly go through the, um, get an idea of the how, how much the role sings on stage, getting an idea of the tessitura. Does it sit really high? Does it sit really low? Okay, good to know. Seeing kind of what the, what the uh, other characters, how much the other characters are involved with your character. Is it a lot of duets? Or is it a lot of ensemble numbers? Or is it, does your character sing by themselves a lot? Things like that. And then I go through the text, beginning to end every single character's lines all the way through. I translate everything as much as I can on my own with the dictionary, or I'll look it up. I have my Nico Castell. I don't know if you can see these in the frame, but I have my handy dandy Nico Castell books are really nice um, resources if you have access to those. Uh, if not, there are all, there are translations all over the internet of everything. So um, that's really not that hard to find anymore. Uh, and I get that all written down and I get an idea of the arc of the story. And then I, what, I try to find the part that looks like the hardest and work from there. And um, those are the kinds of habits that I actually built up in college, learning to learn music that way. I learn it with the piano, picking notes if I have to. If uh, I don't use a recording unless it's an opera that has, um, for example, a lot of stylistic traditions. So if I want to get an idea of a cadenza, what I might do for a cadenza, then I'll turn to a recording and hear what Sills does and what Kalas does and what Scotto does and what whomever. Uh, Otherwise, I learn it organically first, on my own first, and then I put, and then I start listening to a few recordings to get an idea. If you just are sitting on the train and you want to listen to the opera for the, just listen to it all the way through just to get an idea of what the music sounds like, go for it. But I don't encourage you to learn your music by listening to a recording. Okay, um, let's see. These are such fun questions. Natalia Trigo, any tips for the soprano passaggio between E and G5? You close the space. So it's here, really, really. So if I'm singing from, oh, this is in a much more open place. Oh, I have to start closing. I can go. Oh, you have to cover and close when you hit the passaggio. This is E flat. Oh, you close. You close. I'm narrowing the position into a more narrow vowel. So for me, that might be uh or ah uh, or uh, French vowels. I don't go ah. Uh, you can't do that up there. You can't open. You must cover and close the voice during the passaggio. Once you're clear of the passaggio, uh, then you can start opening up again. So the passaggio is a bottleneck. So find a vowel that is narrower for you, but forward and focus your sound into that. Don't push, just focus the sound into a more forward, small, closed vowel. That's a very good question, Natalia. Giacomo Nanni, did you ever study with Angela Giorgiu? I found some similarities in your Gilda in Rome. Thank you, that is very high flattery. I very much appreciate that. I've never studied with Angela Giorgiu. I've sung on stage with Angela Giorgiu, and she has an amazingly beautiful voice, and I thank you so much for the compliment, but no, I've never studied with her. Healthiest and best, best ways to mark from my friend Tracy Davis. Best ways to mark. A lot of singers mark a lot uh, and some singers mark never. Uh, I think it's really up to the individual, but sometimes you mark down an octave. If the stuff is, if I'm singing high notes all night long, I'm going to mark down an octave if I have to during rehearsals and that's what I would do. But if down an octave is not feasible because the roll's already low, or it's going up, it's like switching octaves all the time, then I would just sing on the lightest ed edge of your head voice. So um, let's say I was gonna mark De Vieni Non Tardar. So there's this full voice. De Vieni Non Tardar. And then I'm exhausted, I don't wanna sing full voice anymore. Never mark your text. Only mark your singing. So back off on the voice, keep the text in your teeth and very clear, but always mark on the edge of your head voice. Nobody's judging you on how you sound when you mark, but don't tense up because it's very easy to do that. I don't find marking the most comfortable thing to do and I really only do it if I absolutely have to, but I never mark my text. So always just sing the consonants, get the, con get the in your mouth as much as possible because otherwise you'll get used to singing mushy. Nobody wants that. Okay. Do you, from Tamara Ivanis, do you vocalize every day? How do you deal with days when you're not in good voice? 
Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Do I vocalize every single day? Not formally, but yes. <laughs> I find I sometimes I'm singing and I don't even realize I'm doing it. So uh, I vocalize for sure if I have a if I have to work if I'm working and I'm singing in rehearsals every day on the regular. Yes, I vocalize in the mornings and I get myself ready to go. In the shower, it's the most comfortable time for me. Uh, but if there are days when I'm not singing i really do take rest very seriously it's very important that you recover especially if you are tired after performance if you've just sung a performance the next morning and you vocalize all day long as though you're warming up to sing again vocalize but then don't sing anymore you know what i mean don't necessarily you don't need to do two hours every single day although sometimes i do it and i don't even realize i practice i do other things that i'm singing and i'm humming and my husband says you know you've been singing for like four hours i don't even realize i'm doing it so yes I do, I think when you're a singer, you just sing all the time, but as far as formal vocalese to, in order to warm up the voice, in order to accomplish something, that kind of vocalizing, I really only do when I'm performing and working. Okay. How do you deal with days when you're not in good voice? Yes, that's also a very good question. There are days when you are sick or you are tired or you are, have been crying or you're stressed out or you had a fight or your voice is in a high, weird place or whatever. Yes. It absolutely happens. The best thing to do is to not freak out, take it easy, sleep, take a nap if you need to, take a rest, you know, eat well. If you, one thing I do, and I've done this for a long time, is I keep a food diary. So I t keep a journal very carefully of everything that I am eating and drinking. And I notice this way if I wake up feeling scratchy in my voice, for example, or dry, what did I have to eat? What did I have to drink? How was I feeling? Uh, and I did this for a year, almost two years, and I discovered so much about what I can and can't eat when I need to really be on point. Um, so I would encourage you to try doing that and see how it makes, because it's very individual. Everybody has their specific thing that works for them. Some people can drink alcohol, for example, and some people cannot. So it just depends on you. So, but when you're not well and you're not in good voice, relax, it's okay. You're a human being, you're not a machine. Uh, but definitely remember that finding a good and solid technique, if you're not in good voice and you have to sing and you have to perform, and, and you're not sick, but you're just not in good voice, then you really need to make sure that you assess your technical, what you're doing technically to get through a part. You know, that you're always singing on the breath, that you're always singing in a, in a free and open place, that you're always singing in, on forward vowels and in a, in a nice in, in a nice resonant place because that will get you through anything so as long as your technique is solid generally you can get through as you can you can get through I've sung sick I've sung tired I've sung performances that have had to be back to back I mean yeah you're not going to sound exactly perfect all the time I mean that's just life you know but build your technique and it definitely will help okay so, almost done, almost done. Thanks, y'all. And there's a lot of questions. I, okay, so someone said, uh, Patricia Wesley, what is your favorite role you've ever performed and which role has been your most challenging? It's a very good question as well. I love every role that I'm doing at the time that I'm doing it. I love Gilda. I love Lucia. I love Traviata. I love Susanna. I love everything. So honestly, it's very hard for me to choose a real honest to God favorite. But if I had to say musically the most rewarding, what I feel like just, oh, I just wonderful i really do feel as lucia actually i love lucia um and what is which role has been the most challenging well i've had roles that weren't necessarily vocally difficult but they were physically very draining so and then i've had the opposite i've had roles that were vocally like just oh my god kicking my butt but i had to just stand and sing <laughs> stand and sing so for me that would actually probably be the daughter of the regiment daughter of the regiment sings all night long several very difficult arias. She sings Chaka Le Se, she sings Il Faut Partir, and then she comes on stage and sings a huge voice lesson and then sings Parlerant and Salut à la France. It is a marathon of a role and it's often very physically active because she is a soldier girl. So you are running around, you're marching, you're climbing on things, you're saluting, you know, you are fighting, you are all those things. It's extremely challenging. So I would say that is the hardest role I've ever done. Uh, one person said, Jean Man, I'm confused. I thought your teacher was Bill Schumann in New York City. Do you have two teachers and is that common? 
That is a great observation. Thank you. I do have a teacher in New York City, Bill Schumann. Bill Schumann started teaching me when I entered the Lindemann program uh, because I was living in New York and that's who I saw regularly. And I love working with him and I still do work with him. Uh, and I check in with him when I'm, when I'm in New York and I check in with Mr. Grayson when I'm in Louisiana. So yes, I actually have several teachers. And in fact, it is common for uh, singers to have only one that they do everything with. And it's also common for singers to have a teacher that worked with them a lot when they were younger and then coaches and teachers that they adopted much later in life. You know, So a lot of singers have multiple inspirations and multiple coaches. And it is good to have a, a couple of different ears. You know, you have you may have one teacher that's very um, knows you very well in from a technical aspect, and then you may have one teacher that knows you very well from a personal point of view. They know who you are as a person a lot more, and they know what things affect you and what things you know stress you out. And they can give you they can be almost like life coaches for you. And then you have teachers that know a lot about you musically and may be able to bring the best out of you musically, but they don't know how to tell you technically how to do it. So you know, I have some conductors, for example, that are one that wonderfully work wonderfully with me musically but they could never say if you just fix this vowel and lift your tongue or, or lower your tongue and lift your palate that's what a voice teacher would tell me so I, I there are teachers uh, all over um, my life that that work on different things uh, but to name a few so I have Bob Grayson in here in Louisiana Bill Schumann in New York City uh, at the Met I coach a lot with John Fisher who is the head of music staff there and he worked with us he's worked with me since I was a young artist and he's a coach but he's also very much uh, understands the voice very, very well and can and knows my voice and can get the best out of my singing. Uh, and he works extremely diligently. Uh, and he's also uh, like a specialist in bel canto and a specialist in everything. So it's, it's nice to have someone with those qualifications. Um, I have coaches like Stephen Eldridge at the Met, who's extraordinary, uh, really, really works well with singers and is great because he's heard everyone do everything. He gives you great musical advice about what to do where, what sounds good in your voice, what sounds better in your voice. He's a voice teacher. He just doesn't like to admit it. Uh, I have uh, Bob Cowart in New York City, who is uh, the language coach at the Met and um, speaks everything and also is a voice teacher and doesn't admit it uh, and and teaches um, what vowels sound good in the soprano voice and what vowels sound better in the tenor voice and what vowels sound good in passaggio and what sounds good on the top what's like he's the one that talked about covering in the passaggio he's the first person to ever introduce that concept to me and he was a language coach and he's like you know when you get to these notes it sounds better when you sing this or that vowel and I'm like really Oh, okay, now that somebody broke it down for me that way, now I can apply it, and I do, and I've applied his concepts forever. Uh, so that's just a few, to name a few, there are many, many, many more, and, you know, they all are, they all, I've, and, and of course, and of course my coaches that have been great, that are great divas, like Renata Scotto, who is, I take all my bill canto to her. And I did when I was a young artist uh, as well. And whenever I, she's in town and I can see her, I try to, because she gives the advice that, a singer can give to another singer. So all these different, it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Renata Scotto. I love you. Ken. Huh? Oh yeah. And I also should mention Ken Noda, who is my, who's like my best friend, but also the most wonderful pianist and the most amazing musical coach of life. And he works at the Met also. You know, a lot of my coaches are from the Met because that's where I went right after college. Uh, and he he's everything. I couldn't even name him as one particular thing. I mean, he's kind of musical. Uh, he's an incredible pianist. He'll, he'll, he knows how to interpret work, how to interpret music in a way that very few people know how to do. And so when I want um, someone who has who gives me interpretive inspiration, he's the one that I go to. Uh, and I go to him every time I'm in New York, too. Jim Politowski says, why do you seek more input now? Is it the same routine in preparing for every new performance? So um, this is a gentleman who heard me sing Lucia already once many years ago when I sang it in Princeton. I guess that was about eight years ago now. Uh, and Jim, that's really a good question because sometimes you'll sing a role for a while and then you won't touch it for years and years and years and you come back to it and you sound completely different and you feel completely different. So because I haven't sung Lucia in a few years, uh, I wanted to come back to it fresh and with a fresh ear and because my voice is different than it was eight years ago it feel a lot of things feel a little different I have to kind of come at it with my new toolbox 
Wang Jinwen asks, when is your plan to release an album? I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And that's a great question. That's the last one. Uh, and the answer is, the industry is different than it used to be. It used to be getting a record label, I guess, was more common and uh, easier to do. And it seems like it's a little more difficult now because um, we just have more availability online and um, more options to release things that way. And so a lot of singers don't really get record contracts traditionally anymore. But uh, I definitely am trying to do my part to release what I can. So we actually have some something we're recording, we're working on recording in the next um, month that we will release and produce and make ourselves. <clears throat> and we're going to put it out online on Spotify and, uh, and whatever we can release. My husband does all that. I don't know. We're going we're to put music online uh, because it's a start. And you're right. I mean, I, I want to have things out there. I want to have things available. But as far as doing it traditionally, like via making a getting with a rec major record label, I'm not there yet. Uh, so I hope one day that will change and I'd love to be on, on records, you know, but I do have things that I'm on uh, that the Met has released, like DVDs that I've been in performances um, and those are definitely out and definitely available, um, but it's not like a, a solo album. But we are, we are going to do what we can do within our power to prepare and release and fund and all that, our own, uh, as much as we can, whatever I, I, I can put out there. So um, thanks so much for following me and for always keeping up with me. Um, I really, really appreciate that everyone's always tuning in and I love getting questions and I try really to answer every one of, of them if I can. So thanks so much for watching this video. I know it's a little long, but um, you know, you guys deserve it. <laughs> you watched my whole other video. So thank you so much and take care and happy Mardi Gras. It's this Tuesday, so bye.